across the point, the Germans from shell hole to shell hole, crater to crater, uh, trying to get over to the west side of the point, which was where I had three gun emplacements to take out. I got there and there wasn't any evidence that a gun had ever been in any of them. I was angry. I was angry because some stupid intelligence was not working. And here we are rescuing a lot of guys' lives to get up there to knock these guns out. And it's the business of intelligence to tell us whether they're there or not. And we were led to believe they were there and they weren't there. And we pursued this matter after the battle was over with the uh, French underground, and they swore to us that they had given the information to the proper channels, but nobody got it, and nobody told us, and we lost a lot of guys, 81 killed with me that day. Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. I grew up in Point Pleasant Borough, or Beach. I went to Point Pleasant Beach High School uh, before the war. Uh, and I went away to college on an athletic scholarship and uh, graduated from college. And in 1941, I graduated from high school in 37. And, uh, graduated from college in uh, 41, and then uh, they had Pearl Harbor, you see, at the end of the year, and I went into the service. Prior to that, I was in the Depression. I grew up in the Depression, uh, which was an exciting time, too. And what was that like, bud? Well, my mom and dad were uh, immigrants from the Scandinavian countries, Norway and Sweden, and they came over and they married and they, we had, literally had five kids. And um, he was a house painter and nobody was having their houses painted during the war or during the depression, they would do it themselves. So, but he struggled, the uh, Scandinavians, if they put them near the ocean or a bay or something, they'll live right out of the bay or the ocean. So there was plenty of fishing out of Point Pleasant. Uh, commercial fishing, and and I had a little crab car business. Uh, I furnished soft crabs for the restaurants on the boardwalk, and that was big money in those days. Uh, so we managed to. Uh, my father wouldn't go on a relief. He was so grateful to be an American citizen. He wouldn't uh, have anything to do with that. But we made it. During this period of time, but were you aware of what was happening overseas? in Europe as well as in Asia, and did you ever think it would involve the United States? Oh, I knew I was be involved. I was, uh, see, when I got out of college, I took a job as a freight brakeman. I lived in Jersey City uh, next to the freight yards. And as a freight brakeman, I could see all this war material being transferred all over the country, and I would be on these freight trains, uh, taking them up to Boston or taking them down to Virginia. Uh, and. Uh, War was inevitable, and then came Pearl Harbor. Um, and at all at the same time, 
I wanted to uh, advance my college education or my education, get some more education, because uh, I knew that was the way out of poverty. So um, I tried to get into West Point, become an officer. So I only had a, a baptismal certificate. Uh, well, uh, that wasn't enough. They sent my papers back and said, you got to get a birth certificate. Well, to make a long story short, uh, I finally gave up trying to get it myself. I hired a lawyer uh, and I found out that I was adopted. I never had known that. Uh, my wonderful mother and father, Pauline and George Lomel, uh, had lost a son that I knew about years before. Uh, but uh, I did not know that they uh, took me in and raised me. Uh, so uh, I couldn't get to West Point with a lack of a birth certificate. So I went into service and uh, I became a lawyer and um, I became an officer in two years, <laughs> which would take me four years at West Point. Uh, so that's the story of uh, how I eventually became an officer in the United States Army. Bud, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? And how did you feel about the attack? I, I probably was working on the freight trains. Uh, and of course, the first thing you think of in a situation like that is stepping in a nearby church somewhere and giving a prayer to things will work out all right. Uh, I remember doing that, and I don't remember the church. It must have been a church in Jersey City if I was there, because I, I lived in a room over a bar, Shelly Higgins' bar, on, uh, in, uh, in, uh, right next to the rail yards. Uh, I forget the name of that street now, but uh, I probably went to church. I know I did that when the war was over. Uh, I think I got my wife to go with me. Uh, I'd be grateful for that happening. But uh, I was just like any other American, upset that uh, we were going to go to war, and we did. We were chosen to go to a special school uh, for ranger training. There had not been a ranger school in America at that point in time. Uh, the first ranger battalion was uh, put together over in North Ireland and in Scotland. That's Colonel Darby's first ranger battalion. I joined the second ranger battalion. Anyway, there was a couple hundred of us that went to that special school. We, don't, we were not to know each other and learn each other's names or ranks. We had coveralls. And uh, out of 200, uh, maybe half of them passed, I doubt it. But for the benefit of our audience, what is a U.S. Ranger? Yes, that's an interesting uh, question. I, to this day, I'm asked almost everywhere I go, what is a Ranger? They think I cut grass out in the National Park somewhere. Uh, well, uh, it's the, I say we're the kind of part of the British Commando. We were trained by commandos, we fought with the commandos, we competed with them in sports and everything. Uh, uh, they're all, the rangers are all volunteer men. They're, they're carefully chosen. We had 2,000 volunteers. Uh, we finally took 500. The rest were rejected, uh, which breaks their hearts sometimes. But uh, we're very careful. Uh, we look for a high IQ, we look for uh, physical stamina, we look for courage, determination, uh, uh, we look for good thinkers, practical thinkers, people with good common sense. Uh, we look for that kind of guy that can think on his feet and think quickly and uh, can take care of any situation you may be confronted with. Uh, and uh, I guess that answers your question. They're actually special guys. But as a U.S. Army Ranger, where did you train, and what was Ranger training like? Uh, well, uh, we started in the schooling. We started in the schooling of uh, the training in Fort Meade, Maryland, when I was a member of the 76th Division. Uh, I told you uh, we had a couple hundred uh, guys in that first Ranger school that we had in America in World War uh, II. Uh, but what happened there was after we completed, I got a call up at the 417th Regimental Headquarters where I was an acting first sergeant. You see, it was at that time when the older non-coms in the divisions were being pulled in to their higher reserve rank. They were maybe captains or lieutenants prior 
to that point in time, but went back to their first sergeant's job uh, till the war came along, and then that's what happened. The war came along, and they, all those older guys that were in the reserves got back their commissions. Up come us younger guys, and they were grooming us to take over their positions, and that was the position I was in. And this general called up from the executive officer of the 76th Division, and he said. Uh, uh, Sergeant Long Island, I was a sergeant at the time of the intelligence and reconnaissance uh, platoon. He said, how would you like to be the first sergeant of a ranger company? Uh, well, I said, uh, John, I have to talk to my company commander about that and my platoon leader, uh, but it sounds good to me. Um, how much time I got? And he says, you got two days. And so I talked to him, to make a long story short, I was selected. Uh, of course, I thought I was the only person to select it, but I got there, there was five other guys selected. <laughs> and I had to take examinations and things, uh, 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 but I got it. And I took 70 other Rangers, volunteers, to uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, not far from Chattanooga, in the Great Smoky Mountains, where our training really began. Um, it was horrendous as far as the physical aspects of it. Uh, we were quite certain that combat couldn't be as bad as uh, training. That's exactly what it was. But was that at a camp there, or was that just in general no, within the Smoky forest. Mountains? No, Camp Forest, Tullahoma, Tennessee. It was a camp, you know, in those days. I'm talking in the summer of the 90, uh, 42, 1942. Camps were coming up all over the country, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of guys that are coming into these camps and have to be trained and we have to be ready. You know, we only had 170,000 people in uniform on, on Pearl Harbor Day. 170,000. That's nothing. That's like 14th or 15th behind Romania or something like that. And so we were not ready for it. So uh, that's where uh, many of us uh, to this day contend that our civilian population was not given the credit that they deserved because what they did for us to by D-Day we had two and a half, twelve and a half million, but two and a half million to take care of D-Day if we needed them. We didn't need that many, but uh, to train them men to get those divisions ready to produce, we outproduced 35 Allied nations in getting ready to take our part in the war. Uh, so that's why we were such an important ally to the rest. So. Um, I trained in those mountains and mountain climbing, cliff climbing, everything you can imagine uh, they did for, made us do. Uh, uh, long hikes, uh, 25 miles was nothing. Um, uh, I tell you, the day was uh, at the end of the day you were bruised and contused all over and in pain and, and they slept like a rock. Next thing in the morning, up for a five mile run across the swamps in the water, out of water, up the hills, up the mountains, down the, uh, the physical aspect of it. They wanted to make you into a superman, physically, so you can stand everything. But during the day we would have uh, sessions, uh, instructions, and learn every weapon. You had to be an expert in every weapon. Try to be, anyway. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, uh, we the motto of other rangers in those days was to be the best of the best, and we thought we made it. And out of the 2,000 that volunteered, 500 has made it, and they sent us overseas in November of 43. How did you get overseas, bud? On the Queen Elizabeth. First class. <laughs> bud, with all that training that you undertook, do you feel it did prepare you for what you experienced on D-Day 6th of June? Yes, I, I thought I was well prepared. I, I never believed that if anybody would kill me, I'd get him first. <laughs> so I, I was very confident. Uh, that was one of our failings. We were very confident. Some people called it conceit. Could you describe how your unit embarked for the invasion itself? And what were the weather conditions in England and in the Channel at the time? Well, uh, again, uh, we lived with the British people, you know. Uh, we rented a bedroom, a couple of guys in each house and things like that. It was a nice, we had a nice relationship with them. Uh, so we had, uh, when it came to the, uh, to the invasion itself, they had what they call a, a channel steamer. It's a reduced liner type of, it ran between uh, England and France uh, with a vacation civilian life before the war. 
Well, that was our transport and home while we were waiting for the, the, for the invasion to start. Now, in April of 1944, uh, we learned for the first time that we were going to be in the invasion. And that's when we're in the marshalling area where you're locked in and you can't uh, roam around and talk about it. And uh, we were not allowed to talk to anybody about it. Did you know the objective at that particular no, time? No, no, They gave us aerial photographs that the 8th and 9th Air Force were taking. Um, uh, what you got to also know about this, it uh, didn't seem to surface so much later, was, you know, when our bombers leave England to bomb Germany or anywhere they're going to bomb, they can't return to England with loose bombs in their bomb bays. They must dump them into the English Channel as they're flying back into England to their uh, base. Uh, the reason for that is the English people don't want their countryside all blown up. So it was either dump them in the English Channel on your way home or drop them on any German position you may become aware of. Um, and of course point to Hack, which and we didn't know this then, which was our ultimate objective, was practically bombed out of sight by the time uh, D-Day did arrive. And a, lot of and a lot of questions were answered because f for months and months, these pilots, our uh, American pilots uh, and English pilots were dropping their excess bombs on Point Hoc. We didn't know that. So when we climbed to the top of it, we didn't find any guns there. We found uh, telephone poles sticking out of the place. was in tremendous encasements. And there were all kinds of uh, uh, things to mislead you into thinking there were guns there. Uh, and we were only trained from the aerial photographs. Uh, and uh, we later learned that the uh, uh, French underground had notified England that uh, the, the guns had been removed or not placed there. Now this is a fortress. Point de Hoc is one of the most expensive fortresses that they had. Underground quarters living quarters, railroads uh, to cart their big gun shells in. You know, these are big guns. Uh, God, you couldn't get one of them in this room. Besides, it would be pointing 20 feet above it. Um, they uh, live there, the men live there. They, uh, you can see in the pictures, they have a big uh, observation post out on the point. That's there to this day, if you went there today. Uh, it's just like it was the day it was built because all the bombs, uh, and I'm talking thousands, tens of thousands of bombs dropped on it, never damaged it one bit. We had to go in and kill those guys to uh, stop them. Uh, e Company uh, did that, for, uh, that was their job. Well, my job was to get the guns, and the rest of the guys got the guns. So, uh, uh, the guns weren't being fired because they couldn't get their fire uh, orders back from the point because it was under siege by RE Company. It was DE and F Company that landed the D-Day there at Point de Hoc. And uh, we didn't know where the guns were. We didn't, we didn't have any intelligence on this. So when we got there and went through that awful battle and, got the, and took possession of this point, we started looking for the guns and there aren't any guns. Uh, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, so we thought, well, every good artillery outfit has them off in the position. Uh, maybe we'll hear them fire. Then we'll go look them up, find out where they are, see how many men we need to take back to get them. And uh, that's what we did. Um, we were constantly uh, under attack fighting with the Germans because they were like rabbits. They were popping up in these tunnels all over that, under the surface of that point, as you look at it there. And first we'd be firing at them here, and then they'd be behind us, and we couldn't understand this because we hadn't any information with regard to that either. So that was uh, surprise number one that uh, shook us up. And then, of course, when you got to the main road, the coastal road, you come into the hedgerow. Now, uh, for a country board from Ocean County, I'm used to the hedgerows you see around here. Uh, maybe, maybe that high. But these things were like nine, ten feet high with trees out of the top of them, 60, 70 feet. You could hide a whole column of tanks in a sunken road, you know, between those farms, between their hedgerows. The hedgerows really, 
uh, built up over the hundreds and hundreds of years. When the farmer cuts down a tree or pulls out a stump or something that goes over to the boundary line and lays there forever, and if it comes across a rock, a rock, see, that comes out and that goes over there forever and ever. And pretty soon, whatever is not needed that is in the way, it forms a, a, a border and soil gets on it and uh, eventually you have to see it. You've been over there, you, you can see it's amazing uh, these hedgerows uh, uh, that go between the farms and pastures and, and sunk in some cases. Um, so that was the next startling thing to cope with was those hedgerows. So uh, not finding any guns, we sought out where we might find them and we were headed inland. But before you go any further, could you describe for our listening audience what the actual landing was like? Can you close your eyes for a moment and just describe what your experiences were as you approached that coast? And the well, first the of all, I started to tell you earlier about being on these uh, uh, channel steamers. They were manned by the British Navy. So we're on a British ship our American commando or our ranger. Um, so we get into our landing craft, which is a small landing craft for, for that type of transport. Had about 25 guys in the landing craft. Uh, we had nine of them, we lost two of them sunk with the sea uh, on our way in. Now, as we left the transports, four o'clock in the morning, it takes us a two hour run to from the transport area. I have a parking plan for all the several thousands of invasion ships that I'll show you as they lay off there and and offloaded the men that went into the LCA, so that means the landing craft assault, as you well know. They're, they're the ships, uh, anything that says LC has landing craft for tanks, for equipment, for vehicles, and men, and everything. Um, uh, we're uh, going, and we were in this column of uh, the LCAs from our several uh, channel steamers <coughs> heading, we weren't paying attention at first, but suddenly we were looking at where this uh, coxswain of our landing craft is leading us, and he chose the wrong point. He chose the point of uh, Point de la Perse, which was an assignment for a C company of our battalion. Um, so, we're, uh, so Colonel also picked up it, he was in the lead craft, he directed them to go right, turn right here sharply, so we had to run a who gauntlet. Was, who was the colonel that you just referred uh, James to? James Earl Rudder, a great man, a wonderful man who rose all the way to uh, a major general and president of Texas A&M University. But he was quite a guy, uh, I'll tell you more about him later, but anyway, he led us along, so we're running a gauntlet along the coast, the cliffs. You see, people think Omaha Beach, they only envision a beach. Well, Omaha, is a, uh, the landing area is called Omaha. That's about six, seven miles wide. That's our landing area. But only one third on the east flank is Sandy Beach, like we know it in Ocean and Monmouth County beaches, or bigger. Uh, the two thirds of it is cliffs and high grounds and abutments. So here we are going to the wrong point. Colonel calls it to his attention, gets his coxswain to take us he runs us about two to three hundred yards off these high abutments westwardly to go to Point de Hoc, which is where our, our mission is. <coughs> and the Germans are up there on that cliff firing at us with all kinds of weapons, <coughs> machine guns, heavy machine guns, mortars, anything, trying to get us on the way up. So we've got to ride three miles under, you can't fight back. So we get up there to uh, Point de Hoc on the extreme right flank of Omaha Beach, what a part of the Omaha Beach landing area. Uh, and uh, my boats were supposed to go around the point and land be, uh, from the west side of the point. Uh, but we were running late because of a mistake, and I said to heck with this. Uh, my company commander's boat was sunk, and two of my boats were sunk, I only had a couple left. And I said, well, let's jam them right in among the other guys from uh, ENF Company, which we did. And as the ramps went down, 
the leader, a boat leader, and I was one, goes straight off. Well, I caught a machine gun slug in the right side, knocked me off with all the stuff in my hands uh, that I was carrying on shore, and I went out of sight over my head. Because, you see, uh, a crater from a bomb in the water, you can't see it on, on the water, how deep that crater is under the water. We didn't know it was there. So we had a heck of a time uh, getting ashore, and we did, and uh, we rushed over to the bottom of the cliff. By the way, as you approach the beach, we have buttons to push with launchers on the gunnels of the landing crafts that send these uh, hooks up, grapnel hooks, that go about 150 feet over the top into the inland, hook in, and of course that rope coming down the cliff for us, it, it builds a traction you could never pull out. Well, of course, they were up there cutting some of them, and the Germans, and trying to shoot us off the ropes as we're trying to go hand over hand, 100 feet up in the air. And we traveled in light, with only our weapons. Um, but we made it, and uh, rather quickly, I think it was 10, 15 minutes, we were up there. And uh, we fought across the point, the Germans from shallow to shallow, crater to crater. Uh, trying to get over to the west side of the point, which was where I had three gun emplacements to take out. I got there and there wasn't any evidence that a gun had ever been in any of them. But at that particular time, what, what was your reaction? What were your feelings when you found out? I was angry. I was angry because some stupid intelligence was not working. And here we are rescuing a lot of guys' lives to get up there to knock these guns out and it's the business of intelligence to tell us whether they're there or not. And we were led to believe they were there and they weren't there. And we pursued this matter after the battle was over with the uh, French underground. And they swore to us that they had given the information to proper channels, but nobody got it. And nobody told us. And we lost a lot of guys. 81 killed with me that day.